When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. What do you think of when you hear the word pride? I think of lions, a lion pride, right? A lion is an apex predator, meaning it's the king of the jungle. There's no other animal that preys on the lion. The lion is the apex predator, the ultimate predator. And I think it takes pride, or the lion, it takes pride in the fact that it's the king of the jungle. You know, it's definitely not a shame to be in the king of the jungle, but what I want you to think of is, have you ever done something in your life that you're not proud of? I know I have. You know, there's a lot of stories in the Bible where men and women do things that they're ashamed of. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we consider the gospel testimonies, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so credible of testimonies because they tell of things that, they're, that are shameful, right? They tell of facts that make themselves look bad. Just for uh, an example, you know, Peter, the apostle Peter denied Christ three times, even though he told Christ, you know, I will never deny you, Lord, never. You see, today I dressed up a little bit <laughs> uh, to make a point that, you know, not only how we, how we dress is important, but to help us understand, you know, why it's important to dress um, a certain way. You know, the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they committed the first sin in the Garden of Eden was they clothed themselves because they were ashamed of their nakedness. The reason I dressed up today is not because that I'm so proud that I'm trying to show off. No, no, no. The reason that I dressed up today is actually because I'm ashamed. To be honest with you, you know, you say, well, what are you ashamed of, Sean? You have nothing to be ashamed of. Listen, guys, I'm a sinner, just like everybody else, just like Adam and Eve were sinners in the Garden of Eden. You know, I don't believe that I'm better than anybody. You know, I don't believe that I'm even worthy to be preaching to you guys today, to be preaching the Holy Word of God. But only by His grace, His mercy, does He allow me the privilege of preaching His Word today. And I'm thankful for that. So I dressed up today in reverence of God and to show my obedience and my submission to Him. A lot of the times in our lives, we make the mistake of confusing obedience and submission with weakness. In other words, just because I choose to be obedient, it is my choice, doesn't mean that I'm weak. Just because I'm obedient does not mean that I'm weak. You know, just like a woman who chooses to submit to her husband does not mean, mean she's weak. It means, hey, she's confident in obeying God, what God said to do. You know, in fact, it would make her wise to do so. Why, why would I say that? Because God said so. You know, God said for women to submit to their own husbands. So when they do that, when they obey God, that makes them wise. Proverbs 11, chap, uh, chapter 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Greetings, friends and colleagues. It's Sean Elvis. In today's video, I'm happy to be wrapping up um, my seven deadly sin series. Today, uh, we're going to do the seventh sin. Um, and we're going to be discussing pride, the sin of pride. Now, here's a fun fact for you. Nowhere in the Bible, not even one time, is pride mentioned as being a good thing. It's always a bad thing. It's always a sin to be proud. Have you ever heard the phrase, oh, I'm so proud of you, or, you know, I take pride in my work. I'm really proud that I accomplished such and such. You know, Psalms chapter 138, verses 6 says, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You see, God is so far above us. He's so much holier than us. He's, be, he's like the apex predator, if you will, the king of the universe. The Bible even refers to him, even refers to Jesus Christ as the lion of Judah. So the, so the Bible compares God, Jesus Christ, to a lion. But this lion, you know, God, he doesn't prey on the weak. He defends the weak. He fights for the weak. The lion, you know, is infinitely smarter than us. He's infinitely stronger than us. He's infinitely more loving than we are. See, God is not filled with pride. He's humble. 
What is pride? Pride, according to the dictionary, is having too much confidence in yourself. You're overly confident. You have uh, confidence to a fault, to the point where you may even be belittling other people. Pride is a sin. Too often we get caught up comparing ourselves to other people. You know, we may go out and we may go to work and we may work hard to accomplish something, you know, and complete a goal. And we may do even something good, something great. And rise above, you know, the rest of the group, all our peers. We're the head of our class, you know, we're the top, we're the top of the of the football team or whatever whatever it is, you know. We distinguish ourselves as successful among the rest. But let me remind you guys, God created the heavens and the earth and everything. He created the whole universe. So when we compare ourselves to God, nobody can compare themselves to God. It's not even close. It's not even a comparison. It's, it's, it's incomprehensible to compare yourself to God. You know, and that's why we often forget and we have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people. We compare ourselves to them. And how do we judge other people? You know, we usually judge people by their outward appearance. You know, we think, we think that, you know, we may be better than them because we dress better, you know, or we're more popular or more rich. We're more rich than so-and-so, so I'm better than them. And we become proud in our own mind, right? Or maybe the opposite is true. You know, maybe you, you don't dress very good. You don't have uh, very good clothing, right, to wear. And you may think, oh, you know, so-and-so over there, that girl, she looks way better than me, you know. I'm not good enough for them, you know, or uh, he's way out of my league, you know. He's way too handsome and rich, you know, or things like this, right? We get caught up. In physical appearance, we don't judge a person's character because we can't see it oftentimes. You know, another, we don't know a person's thoughts. We don't know their intentions. We can't see the true motives behind why they're doing what they're doing. You know, let me give you an example. And let's take women. And I know I, know I pick on women uh, all the time, but that's because women are such good sports, right? <laughs> but anyway... Um, Let's say we take two women, right? And they're both dressed the same. And for the sake of argument, let's say they're both dressed modestly, right? They're, wearing, they're not wearing tight-fitting clothing or revealing clothing that shows off their body or yoga pants or anything like that. You know, they're, they're dressed very respectable. You know, think of like a woman would dress for a wedding, right? They're wearing the, the long white uh, gown and, and, and the veil over their, um, over their head and the whole nine yards, right? So they're really dressed up real good. And so you have two women, right? And but one woman, she's wearing this dress, and her in her heart, she's thinking, "Well, I'm wearing this because I want to impress all my friends. You know, I'm dressed up for this wedding because I want all the attention on me. I want all the praise. I want everybody to look at me and praise me and tell me how beautiful I am. You know, it makes me feel good about myself if I'm the center of attention. Now let's look at woman number two. Woman number two says. No, I'm going to wear this, I'm going to dress the same way, but I'm going to, but, but the difference is I'm going to dress in my wedding gown to glorify God, right? Because it brings glory to God, because God told me that this is the proper attire that I should wear, you know? God told me that I should be wearing a, 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 not a revealing outfit, and I should be clothed like in white to symbolize my purity and my holiness and my obedience to God. You know, she's not really interested in what other people think, right? And what other people say, because she's at peace knowing that God told her, hey, this is the right way you should dress. And that's what gives her the confidence, right? That's why she's dressing that way, because God told her to do that. You see how the first woman is proud and the second woman is humble. She's lowly. But judging just on what we see on the outside, they look the same, right? So on looks, just judging off looks alone, we can't see the intentions of these two women's heart. We can't see that one's proud and one's humble. But there's a difference. You know, there's a difference in having confidence and being proud. You know, and we, and we don't want to make the mistake of confusing confidence with pride. What I'm trying to say, guys, is Anybody can dress in the, in the same clothes that I'm wearing right now. You could put on a, a shirt and you could put on a tie and you can look just as confident as me. But not everybody's going to dress this way to glorify God, to show that they're, 
they're in submission to God, right, in their heart. Because God said so. Because God said, hey, this is the right way a, a man of God should dress. You know, some people just want to put on a show. They just want to look good. They just want to look confident and look the part. And I know, I think that's why many women wear so much makeup all the time, you know, and spend so much time getting pretty because they're either ashamed of their looks or they're so filled with pride, they think they look so good that they, that they think, that hey, give me all the attention for how good I look. You know, if you have a, a King James Bible, I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start here, and, and eventually we're going to get to Daniel chapter 6 in the Old Testament. But I want to begin here in, in Matthew chapter 6, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. You know, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 6, verse 1 says, and this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, Take heed that ye, do, that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Alms just means giving to charity or helping people or doing good works. You know, it, it can also apply the, how you dress, right? How you act or the good deeds you do, things like that. Anyway, uh, continuing, verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms... Do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. Jesus says, you know, don't do good things because people praise you. Or don't do good things because you just want likes on Facebook, or, or you want hearts on Instagram, or you want subscribers on YouTube. No, he says, don't sound the trumpets, meaning don't make a big deal out of it. When you do your good deeds, you don't need to broadcast it to everybody and tell the whole world. You don't need to make front page news. You don't need to make a post about every single thing you do. You know, if, if you read your Bible today, great. That's good. That's good you did that. But you don't need to broadcast it to the whole world so everybody praises you for that. You know what I'm saying? Let's continue in verse 3. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret with and seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly you know jesus is telling us he's not telling us not to do good deeds right what he's saying is that when we do do our good deeds we need to make sure we're doing them for the right reasons like you know it's good to be nice to a woman it's good to hold doors open for a woman you know but if you're being nice to a woman or a man if you're a woman just so that you could sleep with them or, or or get something out of it or so that they could praise you for it. If that's how you think you're going to gain your confidence, you're being nice, you're doing that for the wrong reasons, right? Jesus said, hey, look, God's going to see what's, what's in your heart. You don't have to worry about uh, getting a reward. God's going to reward you. Let's continue. Verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know, many people love to bust out their Bible and go to church and dress up for church and tell everybody, hey, yeah, well, you know, we went to church today and such and such, you know, and put on a show for the world and, and try to show everybody how holy they are on the outside. But inside... Their motives are just filled with pride. They just want everybody to think highly of them. You know, Jesus calls them hypocrites because in their heart, they're just doing those things to pray uh, for praise and recognition of other people, praise of men, to be seen of men. You know, like if they weren't getting seen, if, if they had nobody to, uh, to broadcast to, <laughs> would they still be doing those things? That's what Jesus is talking about. Verse 6. Matthew chapter 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Let me tell you guys something. And go ahead and you can flip over to the Old Testament, uh, Daniel chapter 6. And let me say this. Do you think if I was a young, beautiful woman that I would have more subscribers on YouTube? Do you think that I would get more attention than I'm getting right now? See, my point is this, is that it's really easy for women to get views on the internet. All they have to do is, is put on a revealing outfit and, and, and start 
uh, taking pictures, right? Let me tell you this. If there was a beautiful woman sitting right here where I'm sitting right now, preaching the same message that I'm preaching to you right now, I promise you that she would have thousands more views than me. And this is exactly why God told women not to preach. And it's not because God hates women. You know, it's because it's because God knows when pride cometh, then cometh shame. See, what we need to understand is it's really hard for a woman to control her pride, especially when she's getting so much attention. Because not only is she getting attention because she's young and beautiful, but then you're going to start doubling her attention, right? Remember, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, you know? And, and the, the same applies for a woman, you know? And, cause, and he's not just talking about rich be, being money, right? It can be you're rich in attention or you're rich in beauty or you're rich in popularity, you know? You can be rich in, in, in being popular, right? And the richer a person gets, it's harder for them to remain humble and lowly and, sh- and swallow their pride. You see, a young, beautiful woman, a preacher, a, w- a woman who wants to be a preacher, is, is, is almost like a contradiction because a woman of God is supposed to be lowly and humble, and she's supposed to listen and be in subjection to her own husband, right? And God, remember, God didn't do this because He hates women. He didn't tell women, hey, you can't preach because I, I, you're a woman, right? He's doing this because he wants to protect women because he knows, hey, you might get too puffed up. You might, you, you might become too prideful and arrogant if you get too much attention, right? He doesn't want women preaching for the wrong reasons. You know, in other words, he doesn't want them preaching just to get praise of men. And that's not to say that men can't fall into this sin either, but they're less susceptible to it. You know, it's a lot more tempting for a woman to get up and preach just so that everybody will give her attention, you know. And if you're doing that, she's going to start preaching uh, what you want to hear and not what you need to hear. She's not going to preach the whole counsel of God. You see, guys, I don't make these videos for attention. You know, I don't care if you praise me. I don't care what you write in the comment section. I don't care how many views I get or subscribers I have. What I care about is, am I preaching what God told me to preach? Am I, I, that, I want to please Him. I'm not trying to please other people. I never once asked for, for uh, people to subscribe on my channel. Look at my videos. I don't ask for subscribers. I don't monetize my videos for profit. I don't make a dime off these videos. Because I don't make these videos to, to boost my confidence. I don't make these videos to make money. And I don't have a fear of offending people. <laughs> I don't, I don't care how many people watch my videos. I'm, I'm here to, 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 to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to preach His Word, not my words. I don't make these videos to prove how smart I am or how much of the Bible I know. I make these videos because God told me to preach the Word, to be in season, uh, to be instant in season and out of season. It's what us men are called to do. Us men of God, you know, it's, it's our duty to preach without fear of offending people and preach what they need to hear and not what they just want to hear, what pleases their ears. I preach the Bible and I serve God because I want to serve Him. I choose to serve Him, not because anybody's forcing me. Nobody's paying me to. God doesn't have a gun to my head. God's not telling me, hey, look, Sean, if you don't go out and preach my word today, I'm going to curse you. <laughs> Listen, you know, I, I, know um, I know that God isn't going to get offended if I don't serve Him, right? I'm not going to hurt God's feelings if I don't obey Him, and neither are you. You know, you're just going to hurt yourself. You're just going to hurt other people around you. And you say, well, how do you know that, Sean? How do you know God's not going to curse, curse you for not preaching His Word, you know? I'll tell you something, you know, because when I used to live a wicked, sinful lifestyle, and I'm not saying I'm not a sinner now, but I used to be worse, a lot worse, and God still blessed me. He he still showed mercy upon me. He was still good to me. He still loved me, even though that I was a worse sinner than I am now. So I serve Him now because I want to, not because I have to. I preach because I know that it's the right thing to do. It's It's what's in my heart. And if you're not careful, you might fall into the temptation of preaching for the wrong reasons. You might get filled with pride. Remember, pride cometh 
or excuse me, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. Let's take a look at the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. I want to share a story of, 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 this, of this King Darius, you know, who was filled with pride, and, and the humble servant Daniel, who was unashamed to stand for what is right. And we're going to read this famous story of Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6. But before we read, you know, I want to say a few words about pride. Just real, real briefly, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 5 says, The Bible um, uh, says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. The Bible says, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man. And, and, and you're a man, so even if you trust in yourself, you're cursed. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Right? We shouldn't think that we know everything. We need to go to the Bible. We need to go to God's Word to get our understanding. Psalms chapter 118, verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Confidence. What is confidence? Confidence... To have confidence in someone means you believe in them, you trust in them. The Bible also talks about abiding with people. Abiding, you know, uh, being with people. You know, to confide in somebody means you believe in them, you know. You're putting your confidence in someone. You're putting your faith into it. You know, what are we supposed to confide in? Where is our confidence supposed to be? Is it supposed to be in ourselves? Or in God, are we supposed to make the rules for our life? And oh, I'm going to teach my. I'm, I know how to dress. Or do we want to get it from the Word of God, and have God give us the understanding of, of what's right and wrong, what we should do? You know, what are some things that make you confident? If you have money, are you are you more confident? You know, where should our confidence come from? Should it come from when when everybody's praising us? You know, I remember when I asked my girlfriend out. It took me confidence to approach her and talk to her, strike up a conversation. And later on when I proposed marriage, you know, that took confidence. But do you think I did those things because I thought, oh man, I'm just an amazing guy. <laughs> you know, hey baby, you can, you can be confident in me because I'm the man, right? You know, sadly, I think that's what she thought. You know, she thought, oh, I can put my confidence in him. You know, he's, he's good looking. You know, he's, he's got a job. You know, he's, he's going to provide for me. You know, see, so there's two types of people. There's people who put confidence in themselves, and there's people who put confidence in God. If you're confident in yourself, you're either going to be proud or you're going to be ashamed. If your confidence is in yourself, you're either going to think too highly of yourself and be proud, or you're going to be ashamed of yourself and think, oh, I'm not, I'm not good enough, or I don't have enough money, or I'm not good looking enough. You're going to lack confidence. You know, I know there's a lot of dating coaches out there that tell people you need to put confidence in yourself. You know, men and women, you know, res respond to confident men, you know. But what they don't understand is they're really teaching people to be proud, you know, which is a sin. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 26 says, The Lord shall be thy confidence. The Lord shall be thy confidence. You say, Sean, where should, I, where should my confidence come from? Well, it should come from the Lord. He shall be thy confidence, right? Obeying the commandments of God and knowing that you're doing the right thing and that you're living righteously, that's what should give you, give you confidence. Excuse me. That's why when you go outside, your head should be held high. Not because of how good you look or how rich you are or how, or how popular you are or how many subscribers you have on YouTube, whatever. It's how beating you are to righteousness. The only thing that we should be ashamed of is when we disobey God, when we, when we sin, when we don't follow the commandments of God. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Look at Daniel chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 3. and I'm going to try to cruise through this fast. Then, uh, the Bible says, Daniel 6 verse 3, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So King Darius takes over the kingdom, right? He has three main guys under him. And one of them being Daniel, which, you know, he's called a president. You know, so he made him some president of uh, some area. 
The Bible says that Daniel was the preferred guy of King Darius because he had an excellent spirit. You know, there, there was an excellent spirit in him. In other words, Daniel's heart was in the right place. The king recognized that. He recognized that Daniel uh, wasn't doing things because he wanted power or money or prestige. He was doing things because he genuinely uh, just wanted to do the right thing. And what were those right reasons that Daniel was doing the right thing? You know, let's find out. Verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault on him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So the other leaders were envious of Daniel. And they knew that they were doing, thing, doing things for the wrong reasons. That they knew Daniel was, was serving God, right? But all these people wanted was money and power. So what they did is they planned to destroy Daniel. They were filled with pride, you know. But they, they couldn't find anything to accuse him of because he was following the commandments of God and, and he was just so righteous. That, um, they had to make something up. You know, and let this be a lesson to us. You know, if we put our confidence in the Lord, we submit ourselves to the Lord and follow the Bible, people are going to have nothing to accuse us, accuse against us. No false allegations against, unless it's a false allegation, right? Unless it's a false allegation, they have nothing to accuse us with. Let's continue, verse six. Then these uh, presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said, "Thus unto him, King Darius, live forever." All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whatsoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save uh, of thee the king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign it in writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth it not. Wherefore, King Darius signed uh, the writing and the decree. Now we see here that you know the presidents and the princes came together, and they petitioned uh, the king, and and they and they fed into the king's pride. So they know they knew the king had pride, and and, and the king was very proud, and his confidence uh, wasn't in the Lord; it was in himself. And we know that the king's uh, council knew this because the first thing they said is, "Is uh, King Darius live forever?" You know, they they were praising the king. And let me interject right here and say this. You know, the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's the first and greatest commandment. It means don't put anything or anyone before God. God always should get the praise first. You know, why do you think in the Bible it says the last shall be first and the first shall be last? Because those who put themselves first before God will eventually end up being last. So we always should put God first in everything. And we see here that King Darius was so filled with pride that he wanted to be first. He said, hey, nobody should ask anything from any other god but me. That sounds like a great idea because I'm great, prideful King Darius, right? You know, and a lot of women I, I, on the internet I, uh, I read, you know, they, who are, they have children and, and they don't have a husband. And they say, well, my children come first. My children come first. You know, let me tell you something. If you're not putting God first, shame on you. I don't care if it's your children, right? A lot of um, men will say, well, you know, I'm the prize. You know, these women should be praising me. I'm the prize. I'm the leader. I'm, I'm the builder of society, right? We're the prize as men. You know, what does that sound like to you guys? Does that sound kind of like King Darius? Does that sound like pride? <laughs> and I'm going to fast forward um, for the sake of time. So, but let's continue in, in Daniel uh, let's get to the juicy part. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, Daniel uh, disobeys the law of King Darius. He continues to pray to God. He continues to put his confidence in the Lord. Instead of putting King Darius first, he puts the Lord first. And the other leaders, uh, they get him in trouble with the king because he disobeyed the law. And uh, Daniel's sentenced to be thrown in the lion's den. So let's continue. Skip down to verse 16. Verse 16. Um, and the king uh, commanded... That they brought and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. 
I just want to point out here that Daniel was not afraid. You know, Daniel didn't complain. He didn't object. As far as he knew, he was about to die, though, right? And, you know, he looked death right in the eyes and said, My confidence in the Lord is so strong that even, even though I'm facing death, you know, it won't break my faith. You know, and, and he didn't know he 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 had he, he didn't know if God was going to save him or not, right? And death is the number one fear in the world. You know, everybody struggles with the fear of death, but when your confidence in the Lord, like Daniel's was, you have you have um, the power to face that fear and to not be afraid, right? Imagine if Daniel was putting his confidence in himself, he would have been thinking, "Oh man, uh, there's no way I can survive the lion's den." And he would have begged the king, "Please, King Darius, forgive me. I'm sorry." You know, but he didn't do that, right? Let's read on verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and uh and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Look at verse 18, you know, this this makes me laugh. You know, the king is over here shaking in the boots. <laughs> Daniel's not scared at all. And and the king seems like he's more scared of Daniel, right? Or more scared than Daniel. And, you know, so let this be a verse that encourages you. You know, when you're doing the right thing and your confidence is in the Lord, you know, everybody else who's who's filled with pride and who's trusting in themselves, they're going to be scared, right? Verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in uh, haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouth, that they have no hurt of me. For as much as before him innocence was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Notice Daniel said, How did he survive? My God hath shut the lion's mouth. Amen. You know, when, when Daniel got his victory, when he survived the lion's den, he made it a point to praise God first and give God all the credit. He said, My God saved me. You know, it's really re- important to remind ourselves so we don't become prideful and remind other people that, hey, God was the reason I accomplished this, uh, this, this goal or God was the reason this good thing happened to me, right? You know, all of us are going to go through trials in our life and, and hopefully you don't go through a trial like Daniel did. But, you know, you will have to face something in your life that, that might scare you, right? And I know a lot of men out there are scared of their wives cheating on them, divorcing them, committing adultery, or, or are taking um, their kids away from them, you know. So they think that, oh, well, I'm so scared of this that maybe the alternative is I'm just not going to get married and I'm just going to sleep with prostitutes, right, so I can avoid the snare of adultery or, you know, whatever. But that's not putting your confidence in God. That's putting your confidence in yourself. You know, and if you're doing that, shame on you. You know, if you think that you're so proud, that you're so special, that you can go out there and sleep with women without marrying them, without, um, uh, well, I'll just say marrying them, you know, that you, you're, you're so special, you're so proud that you don't have to provide for a wife, that you can get the milk for free without buying the cow, so to speak. You know, that's pride, my friends. And for the women, you know, let me tell you something. If you want to dress up, and all this revealing uh, uh, clothing and you want to cake your face with makeup so that you can look good to attract a husband or, or so, so that you could parade around as if, oh man, I'm so pretty, everybody look at me. But you don't want to submit to your husband unless he meets your high standards, right? You don't want to get married young. You don't want to bear children. You think that it's okay to post pictures of yourself online to get the praise of men. You know, you ought to be ashamed of yourself if you're not submitting yourself to your own husband at home. You know, let me read from you a passage out of the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 2, you could turn there if you have yeah, time. And the, and the Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. 
Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith, charity, and holiness, and sobriety. Listen, the Bible says for a woman to learn in silence is what she ought to be doing. You know, because it's a shame for a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. Now, it's one thing for a woman to share the gospel with people. That's not what the Bible is saying, that women can't share the gospel. But women are commanded to be in silence in the church, to be in silence and in subjection to their own husbands, you know. But the way I see is all these women preachers nowadays trying to lead churches and trying to take the lead and take authority positions, right, thinking that they can get on a platform and usurp authority over man, what God has given us men authority over, us sons of Adam. The Bible says if a woman wants to preach, to do so with your good works, your shamefacedness, right? You should be in the home. That's where your work is, submitting to your husband, learning from him, and raising your children. If you're not doing that, you know, if a woman's out there preaching, trying to lead, she's, she's proud. She's too proud to be humble and lowly and admit that, hey, I'm not qualified to do this job. According to God, you know, woman needs to humble herself, submit to her husband. She has no business teaching God's word. Now, let me ask you guys something. You know, if, if I was out late at night buying prostitutes and, and buying drinks and getting drunk and paying for strippers, you know, would you guys give me any credibility to sit here and teach God's word? No, you wouldn't. You know, and the same thing with a woman. If she's not at home, uh, submitting to her husband, raising children, guiding the house, you know, she doesn't have any credibility teaching God's word. But let me, let me, let me close because, man, this message is getting long and I, I apologize, you know. Remember, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Pride and shame go hand in hand. The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but give grace to the humble. The Apostle Paul said in Romans, I am not ashamed to preach the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He's not ashamed of it, right? We shouldn't be ashamed of the Bible. We shouldn't be ashamed of following the Bible and the commandments of God, or we shouldn't be ashamed of telling people, hey, this is what the Bible says, right? See, the world is filled with pride. It has no shame. It's just like King Darius, you know, his council of men that tried to get Daniel in trouble. You know, if if you're putting your faith in God and you start following the commandments of the Lord, you will face persecution, right? The world will mock you just like they mocked Daniel and tried to get him in trouble. They'll, They'll make fun of you. You know, you don't think people are making fun of me, you know, when I tell them, hey, I'm celibate, right? I don't, I don't go out and have sex. I don't have sex with women who aren't my wife. You know, you don't think people call me, oh, you're a loser, Sean. You can't get women. Well, let me tell you something. I've lost several jobs for my religious beliefs. I've lost friends. I've had women leave me and break up with me over, over my religious beliefs, over my stance on, on the Bible, because I refuse to back down on what the Bible says. Now, I'm not preaching that we need to go out there and, and, and get on a crusade and, and force everybody to believe the Bible or, or ridicule them for not believing, you know, but what I'm saying is what we need to do is that make sure is to make sure that we are worshiping God in our heart, you know, that our heart's in the right place, that we're standing for righteousness, even though the world is, is, is persecuting us, you know, because if we get filled with pride and we, and we trust in ourselves and our own confidence, We will end up getting eaten up by the lions, right? And and we don't want to get eaten up by the lions. So we need to put our faith and our confidence in the Lord. Anyway, that's my message for the day, guys. I don't want this to go too long. So I hope you understood what I was trying to say. And I hope you received this message well. And man, I hope you enjoyed uh, the preaching on the seven deadly sins as much as I did this past week. And man, I'm so happy. Uh, that, I, that I got this done and, and praise God, praise God for um, allowing me to preach his word and I'll be praying for you guys not to fall into any of these sins 
in any of these temptations. And I ask that you pray for me as well, um, because I'm I'm not some holy, prideful man, or you know that I can't fall into sin either. So please pray for me. Um, anyways, that's it for the day, guys. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. <laughs> as always, I'm gonna give God the last word. So. If you want to turn to James chapter 5, that's the scripture I'll be reading from. God bless you guys. Have a good day. The Bible says, James chapter 5, and starting in verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord's Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and later rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who hath spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. Amen. God bless.